Hello. We continue our conversation with Gleb Vladimirovich Nasovsky about the war between Moscow Tartary and the Russian Empire of the Romanovs, known as the Peasant War, under the leadership of Pugachev. A separate hall of the Multimedia Museum, New Chronology, in Yaroslavl is dedicated to this period of Russian history. The exposition presents a complete picture of the events from the background of the conflict to the final defeat of Tartary. The hall also houses separate modules that tell the story of the creators of the Romanov version of Russian history and their main opponent, the great Russian scientist Mikhail Vasilyevich Lomonosov. Hello, Gleb Vladimirovich. Hello, it's very nice to meet again. Gleb Vladimirovich, in our previous video you mentioned a few interesting facts that before the war with Pugachev, all of Siberia belonged to Moscow Tartary. Please tell us, are there any other facts indicating that the Romanovs annexed Siberia to the Russian Empire only in the late 18th century? When the Romanovs Russia annexed new territories, a distinct coinage was initially minted for these lands. This was a common practice not only in the Romanovs Russia. For example, here is a Prussian coin. It was minted in 1759 during the reign of Elizabeth of Russia when they were planning to annex Prussia. At that time Prussia was almost annexed. The population had already been brought under oath. By the way, Immanuel Kant swore allegiance to Elizabeth. Then, when Elizabeth died, the troops were withdrawn. In essence, Prussia had already been conquered. And a coin was minted for it. This is a transitional Prussian coin. When new lands were annexed, a coin was minted for them for a certain transitional period. And then it was exchanged for the main currency, in this case, the Russian currency. This is a Prussian coin with the image of Elizabeth. The inscription is in German. This is a Crimean coin. It was minted when Crimea was annexed. It says, Torian. Queen Kherson Torian. When Crimea was annexed, for some time, this coin was being minted. Then regular money started circulating there. But in the beginning, they minted a special coin. The Torian coin. And here is a Siberian coin. When Catherine was in power, they didn't officially annex anything. Why did they mint their own special coin? They minted it without explaining the reasons. So, this is a case that fits into a clear pattern of annexing new lands. I will show more examples. They annex a new land and mint their own coin for some time. The same was done with Siberia. They minted a coin specifically after Pugachev's events, during Catherine's reign. And then this coin disappeared, and regular currency circulated in Siberia. Here it is written at the bottom, 10 kopecks, Siberian coin. Do you see it at the bottom left? On the rim, Siberian coin, 10 kopecks. Not only did they change the currency, but they also changed the system of governance. 
It is known that there were voivodes in Siberia. In the Romanovs' Russia, there were governors, while in Siberia, there were voivodes. They say, well, big deal. Everywhere there were governors, but in Siberia, there were voivodes. However, after Pugachev, the voivodes disappeared. Governors appeared, and there was a redistribution of provinces. What was done there? In Russia, there were governorates. This one, that one, Voronezh, Moscow, Kazan, and some others. And suddenly, after Pugachev, the Kazan governorate turned out to be tens or hundreds of times larger than all the others combined. So, all of Siberia suddenly became part of the Kazan governorate. They woke up one morning and found out that, apparently, the entire Siberia was part of the Kazan governorate. And it was always like that. They said, well, it's amazing that we have one large governorate, but it can't be like this. Let's divide it. And after Pugachev, this Kazan governorate was divided. It was divided into the Yenisei governorate, Yakutsk governorate, and others. These were all parts of the Kazan governorate. So you see how they manipulated everything on paper? This coin is also Siberian and from the time of Catherine the Great. Then it disappeared. There was no more Siberian coin. It appeared just at the end of the 18th century, and then it disappeared. Here it is, enlarged. See it, on the left. Siberian coin. Ten kopecks. Catherine II. The Romanovs tried in every way to represent on paper that Siberia belonged to them. In reality, it did not belong to them. There is another striking detail that shows it did not belong to them. It is the gold rush of 1815. If you look at what is written about gold mining in Siberia, there is an edict of Alexis of Russia stating that they needed to go to Siberia to extract gold. Of course, this edict was found after Pugachev. Obviously, it was written backdated. Naturally, it is fake, but it is dated to the 17th century, and it depicts a scene as if Tsar Alexis is sending his people to Siberia to explore gold. Well, fine, in the 17th century Alexis sends his people to explore gold. But why didn't they find anything? Gold was simply lying on the surface in Siberia. In 1815, Russian gold miners went there. I mean, Russians from the Romanovs Russia, from the central region. Before that, of course, there were Russians there as well. They discovered abandoned gold mines. Not only gold, but also copper. Millions of tons of tailings. Some discarded boots in these mines, not yet decayed. In 1815, the gold rush began and gold mining in Tsarist Russia increased a hundredfold. The question is, if Siberia belonged to them, why didn't they see any of this before? Moreover, it is written that Siberian mines were operating. On paper, the Romanovs claim that Siberian mines were operating in the 18th century, but they only extracted small particles of gold there some kilograms or hundreds of grams. I don't remember, some laughable figures. And in the early 19th century, there was already a flow of gold that exceeded everything they had mined before by a hundredfold. But in the 17th century, when supposedly Siberia belonged to them, the treasury was empty. It is known that the Romanovs had enormous difficulties with gold and silver. When Lomonosov was awarded a prize of 2,000 rubles, the treasury was empty, and they brought him copper. 2,000 rubles in copper amounted to several cartloads filled with copper coins due to the absence of silver and gold in the treasury. This was a well-known, curious case. And then suddenly, after the victory over Pugachev, there were torrents of gold, silver, and diamonds. And this also vividly demonstrates that the Romanovs only possessed Siberia on paper. 
and only when they got their hands on it, they cleaned it out. Not just got their hands on it, but cleaned it out. It was a true genocide. In reality, before Pugachev, foreigners traveled across Siberia. It was an entire Russian civilization. There are picturesque paintings depicting how people lived there. By the way, they wore turbans. They had such a custom similar to what we had in Russia before. Voivodes ruled there. Their life was calm and measured. And there are maps with a huge number of populated places, cities, villages scattered throughout Siberia. All of this was wiped off the face of the earth. They engaged in extermination for several decades. And only after that did they go there and start extracting gold. They couldn't conquer the American lands. Now I will tell you a bit more about all this. Here are maps from the 18th century. North America. How they imagined North America, for example, in the Encyclopedia Britannica before Pugachev. You see, Europeans didn't even know how the western coast of North America looked like. It fades into the ocean. The southern part of North America is somewhat known, but as for the northern part in Alaska, no one knows anything at all. Couldn't they sail along the coastline on a ship and chart it on a map? They've already explored Australia and various islands. But they couldn't do it for North America? If they didn't sail, it means they weren't allowed there. And after Pugachev, they were allowed. And immediately the maps were corrected. Here's another map of North America. Take a look. They don't even know if California is an island or a peninsula. In reality, California is a peninsula, but they think it's an island. Look closely. They drew the coastline, but incorrectly. They should have drawn California as connected to the mainland. It's a peninsula. They depicted it as an island. They didn't understand yet, didn't know, and made a mistake. There were often errors in the 18th century. They saw the southern part of the California Peninsula. They had been there, they knew. But they didn't know about the northern part of the California Peninsula where it joins the mainland. You see how many different toponyms they know but they know nothing in the Northwest. And in California, by the way, there are also very few names. Here's another map. Again, California is shown as an island. Here's the map of the 18th century. The western coast of North America is unknown. The interior of North America is unknown. They still consider California an island. They don't know. Here, 18th century, they don't know. But if you look at Ptolemy maps, ancient Mercator maps, everything is depicted there. Both California as a peninsula and the western coast of North America are shown. It should be understood that on most authentic 18th century maps, the western coast of North America is not depicted, it's unknown. But there are some maps, supposedly even older, from the 15th-16th centuries, ancient ones, where everything is already skillfully drawn. One should be careful with maps because there are many forgeries among them. Ancient maps are made to be sold at high prices. And very often, they are made by looking at modern maps. For example, in the 19th century, they would draw a fancy map imitating antiquity, retouch it a bit, and say, this is Ptolemy or Mercator, from the 16th century, and they sell them to collectors. Usually, they can be told apart. This is one of such forgeries. On authentic maps of the 18th century, the western coast is unknown. This is also one of the forgeries. And another one.
And here is a map from the time of Catherine the Great when Pugachev was defeated. You see, it's a map of Siberia with such an expressive cartouche. They are killing someone. You see, they are dressed in ancient attire and killing someone. They killed Moscow Tartary. Gleb Vladimirovich, who carried out Catherine II's orders, who was directly responsible for the extermination of Moscow Tartary? Today it is believed to be Suvorov. Of course, he made a significant contribution to the extermination of Moscow Tartary. It is known that he was an extremely bloody person and mercilessly killed the peaceful Russian population. In reality, there was another key figure there. Suvorov was not the main one. Punin was in charge. The portrayal of Suvorov capturing Pugachev is just propaganda. This is Suvorov with a sword decorated with diamonds, which he was awarded. He received two such swords. But the main person was Punin. Today, little is said about him. But he was mainly the person who crushed Pugachev. By the way, he also took Berlin in the Seven Years' War. This is him in his youth, and this is him when he's older. Why was Punin forgotten while Suvorov was glorified? Because Punin was not going to stay silent. He openly spoke about how he crushed Pugachev. But they invented a story that the Pugachev rebels were just some gangs that scattered when faced with a small detachment led by Mikkelson. And allegedly, there was no war. It was a gang of bandits who immediately dispersed. And thus, they deprived Punin and Suvorov, who won this war, of this victory. Suvorov accepted this, but Punin did not. Suvorov turned out to be obedient, but Punin was not. So, as long as Punin was alive, they tolerated him. But when he died, they immediately wrote him off. They said that he had nothing to do with it. He only executed the local population, and everything was done by Suvorov. In reality, Punin was the main figure there. Suvorov obeyed him. It was Punin who defeated Pugachev. You see, Suvorov is not just Suvorov. He is Suvorov Rimniksky. Count Alexander Suvorov Rimniksky. You see, a generalissimo, Prince of Italy, Alexander Vasilievich Suvorov Rimniksky. He had Rimnik. Now the question arises, why Rimniksky? Where does Rimniksky come from? It's because of the great victory at Rimnik. Let's see what kind of victory took place at Rimnik. It is believed that it was a victory over Turkish forces near a certain village called Rimnik, in Moldavia, in Wallachia. It's somewhere around here. Here is Rimnik. Not far from Briela. But to be honest, this victory is called the victory at Rimnik only in Russian sources. The Austrians and other Western foreigners called it the Battle of Mertineshti. In other words, it had another name. If we look at the old maps of the battle at Rimnik, Russian sources say, at Rimnik. But if we look at Western sources, because the Austrians also participated, you see, Russians, Austrians, Turks. The Austrians called this battle the Battle of Mertineshti, not Rimnik. They didn't use the word, Rimnik. The victory was certainly decisive, but not the greatest. I wouldn't say it was the greatest victory that Suvorov achieved. It was one of the victories that Suvorov won. He won many victories. 
And why exactly for this victory was he given such a resounding name? Why was Rimnitsky added to the name Suvorov? All other victories pale in comparison to this victory. Why? Let's look at old maps of this area. It turns out that there is no mention of Rimnik anywhere, but there is a place called Rybnik. The town of Rybnik or the village of Rybnik. I apologize. I must have missed. You see, on the maps, it shows Rybnik instead of Rimnik. Clearly, they are cunning too. They say it's Rimnik, but on the maps it's Rybnik, suggesting that it was incorrectly labeled. Among many of Suvorov's victories, they chose the one that had something similar to Rimnik. Well, they found Rybnik. But in reality, there was a settlement called Mertineshti. And they named this victory the Victory at Rimnik. This is an old map of Moldavia. Here is Rebnik, but not Rimnik. One wonders, what is Rimnik? Why such a resounding name? Suvorov Rimniksky. Rimnik is the old name for the Yaik River, which is now known as the Ural River. And on the old maps, it is marked as Rimnik. Let's have a look. Here's this map. You see, on the left is the Black Sea, on the right is the Caspian Sea. And here, the Yaik River flows into it, which is now the Ural River. Hence the Yaik Cossacks. You see, Rimnikus Fluvius. Rimnik is the name for the Ural, the Yaik River. Here is another map. Here it is in detail. Here, RH is R, Rimnikus. This is Yaik. And here, on this map, here is the complete map. This is a famous map. This is Isaac Massa's map. Let's see how Yaik looks on it. It is written Yaik or Rimnik. Here is Yaik, Olam, that is, or Rimnikus. Yaik or Rimnik. Here's another map, also, Rimnik. There are many of these maps. In other words, the Yaik River today is actually the Oral River. They renamed it. You see how they obscured everything. It was called Yaik, and its other name was Rimnik. And then they came up with a third name, Oral. By the way, why did they rename it from Yaik to Oral? It is believed that it was because there were supporters of Pugachev there. Because they fought with Pugachev there, they even renamed the river. But they remained silent about this name, about Rimnik. They tried to make it disappear altogether, but that's impossible. It is indicated on the maps. That's why the main battles between the forces of St. Petersburg and Tobolsk unfolded here. It was here that a great victory was achieved, for which Suvorov was showered with diamonds. They added Rimnikski to his name. He received a lot for it. Money, diamonds. Well, and then, of course, he engaged in massacre. Here is Rimnik. But there is no Rimnik at the site of the battle in Moldavia. That's the story. It's the Battle of Fakshane and the Battle of Mertineshti. Here is a statue of Suvorov, a monument in the form of an ancient warrior in St. Petersburg. Here is his grave. So, this is what I wanted to tell you. 
Without understanding this, it is impossible to understand Russian history at all. It is a very close epoch to us. It is the knot that was tied in the 18th century. It was a knot tied to Russian history. It was the extermination of an entire civilization, the Russian Siberian civilization, the extermination of a huge number of people, the destruction of traditions, culture, the robbery of this country, the Russian country. Of course, it used to be one country. They separated after the time of troubles, but they adhered to the old order. Why did the Turks betray them? In reality, no one wanted a return to the old order. The same Turkish sultans felt perfectly fine as independent rulers. But if people from Moscow Tartary came to power, they would restore the old order. Turks would be subjected to Moscow's rule, as it had been for a long time. They, in essence, considered themselves equals, but Moscow was stronger. It was the more powerful brother. No one wanted that. If you study history, you see that it always happens like this. Without understanding this, it is impossible for us to understand in which country we live. What kind of country is this? How do we move forward? At the very least, we need to understand that. What follows from this? What conclusions can be drawn? I'm not here to give advice, but it must be understood. It must be recognized, thought through, and understood. We cannot close our eyes to such things. Glad Vladimirovich, thank you very much for this lecture. I thank you for the opportunity to address our readers, to tell them something. But I want to say that these stories do not replace reading books and visiting your museum. So, come to the museum, read books. Dear viewers, thank you for watching our video. Subscribe to our channel if you haven't already. And be sure to visit the Multimedia Museum of the New Chronology in Yaroslavl. We're waiting for you. See you soon.